the state of async rust holy cow i'm in the middle of this picture let me i'm gonna move myself over a little bit the state of async runtime. Recently, I found myself returning to a compelling series of blog posts titled Zero Cost Futures in Rust by Aaron Turon uh, about what would become the Rust or the foundation of Rust async ecosystem and the Tokyo runtime. This series stands as a cornerstone in writing about Rust. People like Aaron are the reason why I wanted to be a part of the Rust community in the first place. Uh, Aaron's the guy that did the whole Tokyo stuff and all that, right? It's pretty based. Pretty based guy right there. While 2016 evokes nostalgic memories of excitement and fervor surrounding async Rust, my sentiment regarding the current state of the ecosystem are somewhat ambivalent. <sighs> Through this series, I hope to address two different audiences, newcomers to Async Rust seeking to get an overview of the current state of the ecosystem, library maintainers and contributing, contributors to the Async ecosystem, in hope that my perspective can be a, a basis for discussion about the future of Async Rust. Okay, the first article. Or right, in this first article, we'll focus on the state of async Rust runtimes, their design choices, and their implementations on broader Rust async ecosystems. One true runtime. An inconvenient truth about async Rust is that all that libraries still need to be written against individual runtimes. Writing your async code in a runtime agnostic fashion requires conditional compilation, compatibil compatibility layers, and handling edge cases. Uh, yikes. It's one of the problems about not having, see, this is one of the problems about just like having the community implement things is that, yes, it's good because you get, you get, it's faster. You get to see all the different ideas come out. You get to kind of see and feel out every single different way things can be done. And you don't have to make bad decisions in early rust or create things that are not good. Stop with the golden kappas. Stop flexing that I don't have one. But the problem then becomes this right here, which is now we have a bunch of different ones. What do we do now? kind of sucks uh executor coupling is a big problem for async rust as it breaks the entire ecosystem into silos documentation examples for one runtime don't work with other runtimes moreover moreover much of the existing documentation uh, on async rust feels outdated or incomplete for example the async book remains in draft with concepts like futures unordered yet to be covered there is an open pull request though Oh, lovely. Uh, that leaves us with a, with a situation that is unsatisfactory for everyone involved. Sorry, this delicious smoothie is making my mouth water. <clears throat> I sucked that one dry. We sucked them dry right there, fellas. That leaves us with a situation that is unsatisfactory for everyone involved. For new users, it is a big ask to navigate this space and to make future-proof decisions. For experienced users and library maintainers, supporting multiple runtimes is an additional burden. It's no surprise that popular crates like Request simply insist on Tokyo as a runtime. Uh, this close coupling is a known issue, which is acknowledged by the Async Working Group. This close coupling recognized by the Async Working Group has me worried about its potential long-term impact on the ecosystem. The case of async standard. Async standard was an attempt to create an alternative runtime that is closer to the Rust standard library. Its promise was that you could almost use it as a drop-in replacement for the standard library. I have spent so many, I, I genuinely spent so long, I don't know how long it was, but it was long in my head, trying to figure out why one of my TCP streams wasn't working, whatever. It's because I was using standard instead of Tokyo, and it was emotionally bruising, and it's like, it should be so simple, but when you're first learning Rust and all these differences and everything named the same and how, you know, sometimes you get those automagic imports and all that. When you're very first learning, you could spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out what's going wrong. Okay, this was a long time ago. But still, I still remember it. That was like my first big this really sucks moment. Uh, take, for instance, this straightforward synchronous file reading code. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, beautiful. Uh, in async standard, uh, it is, let's see, it is an async operation instead. Okay. Bam, 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 bam. The only difference is the await keyword, function coloring, people. We've talked about that a lot here. While the name might suggest it, async standard is not a drop-in replacement for the standard library, as there are many subtle differences between the two. It is, a, it is hard to create a runtime that is fully compatible with the standard library. Here are some examples of the issues still open. New thread spawned, okay, yep, there you go. It is an enormous effort to replicate the standard library and it is not clear to me if it is worth it. Even if it were a drop in replacement, I'd still ponder its actual merit. Rust is a language that values explicitness. This is especially true for reasoning about runtime behavior, such as allocations and blocking operations. The standard, the async standard terms, 
our team's proposal to stop worrying about blocking was met with harsh community response. And I, it, this doesn't feel very harsh. I'm not going to lie to you. Is this why Rust is filled with a bunch of babies? Harsh feedback. I don't... Uh, actually, like, if you really think about it, when you reference the future standard of the project, I really, like, when you check out these few, I, I really do feel like we shouldn't be approaching this topic, and I really do think we should be concerned about it. In my opinion, I feel like these things... Man, that was harsh. This seems like somebody put some thought into it and thought about why we should be worried about these things. <laughs> As of this writing, there are 1,754 public crates that have dependencies on async standard, and there are companies that rely on it in production. However, looking at the commits, uh, commits over time, uh, it is essentially abandoned, and there is no active development anymore. Ah, this looks like grunt. This leaves those reliant on async standard API, bet, uh, be it for a concurrency mechanism, extension traits, or otherwise, in an unfortunate situation, as there is a case for library developed on top of async standards, such as Surf, the core of uh, async standard is now powered by small, oh, so small, but it's probably best to use it directly for new projects. Again, you leave the community to solve it. This is what happens. Have you seen JavaScript tools? Grunt, Gulp, Webpack, Snowpack, Parcel, Vite, TurboPack. Those are like the big ones that I know about. I'm sure there's other ones. Just saying. You leave it to the community, you get sub fractured. You know, you kind of, you have to make this choice. Tokyo stands as Rust's canonical async runtime, but to label Tokyo merely as a runtime would be an understatement. It has extra modules for FS, IO, net, process, and signal handling, and more that makes it more of a framework for asynchronous program than just a runtime. Partially, this is because Tokyo had pioneering role in the async Rust. It explored the design space as it went along, and while you could exclusively use the runtime and ignore the rest, it is easier and more common to buy into the entire ecosystem. Yet, my main concern with Tokyo is that it makes a lot of assumptions about how async code should be written and where it runs. For example, at the beginning of the Tokyo documentation, they state, the easiest way to get started is to enable all features. By do, uh, do this by enabling the full feature flag. This seems like a great getting started guide to me. Hey, you don't know a lot about it? Just do that. Just do that. What is that? Cargo add Tokyo features full, right? It's just a really simple getting started situation. Like, I get that. I'm on that team. You don't, you don't want to explain. Like, a bit. this is one of the problems about Rust in general is that they want you to know everything before you program anything. And so it's just like, do you want to be the person that has to know everything just to use async? Or do you want them to start off with maybe overkill for sure? For sure. You don't need all these features. Start overkill, pare it down. To me, that just seems natural. That's like that's how I like to learn, is that I like to learn by simply, you know, being ignorant of everything and then slowly peeling back the layers. You know what I mean? Damn, I'm late. You're not late. You're not late. By doing so, one would set up a multi-threaded runtime, which mandates the types are send and st uh, static and make... It necessary to use synchronization primitives such as Arc and Mutex, but for all, for all but the most primitive or trivial applications. The original sin of Rust async programming is to make it multi-threaded by default. If premature, premature optimizations is the root of all evil, this is the mother of all premature optimization, and it curses all your code with an unholy send plus static, or worse yet, send plus plus or send plus sync plus static which just kills all the joy of actually writing rust <laughs> it was not pride it was not greed it was send plus sync plus static that truly was the original sin i think it's funny and then god cursed the earth with arc mutexes everywhere arc mutis arc mutices okay you, you, you Zerg Rush, you pretty much now Zerg Rush Arc Mutices. Uh, anytime we reach for an arc, mu uh, arc or a Mutex, it's a good idea to stop for a moment and think about the future implications of that decision. You know, every time I write an Arc Mutex, I sit there and think to myself, ah, I'm watching performance go away. <laughs> well, I guess all of my multi-threaded just is becoming shittier. Like, that's what I think about.
The choice to use Arc or Mutex might be ind uh, indica indicative, indicative of a design that hasn't fully embraced the ownership and borrowing principle that Rust emphasizes. It's worth considering if the shared state is genuinely necessary or if there's an alternative design that could minimize or eliminate the need for shared mutable state. This also highlights a really impressive thing about Rust, which is you just have to think a lot while programming. You know what I mean? Like, you have to think a lot. Have you ever thought about this in Go? What? No? Like, every now and then you gotta throw a mutex around something. But you really just don't... You just don't think about these things, which can be really nice. Uh, and the same with JavaScript. Obviously, you don't think about it in JavaScript, because, well, let's just face it. It's JavaScript. You, you don't think about it at all. You know what I mean? I have void channels. They use, like, five locks. Interesting. Are there more efficient channels? Uh, the problem, of course, is Tokyo imposes this design on you. It's not your choice to make. Beyond the complexities of architecting async code atop these synchronization, synchronization mechanisms, they carry a performance cost. Locking means runtime overhead and additional memory usage. In embedded environments, these mechanisms are often not available at all. Multi-threaded by default runtimes cause accidental compl complexity completely unre or unrelated to the task of writing async code. I will say in general that I, I, I dislike async rust. Every time I do anything beyond trivial, I get a little pissed about it. Maybe after reading this, I need to rethink my stance on async rust in general. And maybe I need to just try a little bit harder to think about it in terms of like my own threads or use something like crossbeam or small or whatever the other one is. Maybe I need to kind of bring it down a little bit and think differently about the problem. Yeah, and then, or just use GNU Parallel. I think GNU Parallel is incredible. I use it all the time whenever I can. However, I have little hope that the Rust community will change the course on this point. Tokyo's roots run deep with the ecosystem, and it feels like, for better or worse, we're stuck with it. In the realms of networking and web operations, it's, like, it's likely that one of your dependencies integrates Tokyo. Was actually very true. Runtime effectively nudging you towards its adoption. Tungstenite, Tokyo, Tokyo Tungstenite. Uh, at the time of writing, Tokyo is used by 20,000 crates. Woof. Woof. That's a lot. Other runtimes. Going beyond Tokyo, several other runtimes deserve more attention. Small, a small asynchronous runtime, which is easy to understand. The entire executor is around 1,000 lines of code. Does it require, like, what does it, I mean, do all these ones somehow avoid the send sync static problem? These runtimes are important as they explore alternative paths or open up new use cases for async Rust. Drawing on a parallel with Rust error handling story, the hope is that competing designs will lead to a more robust foundation overall. Okay, that'd be great. Especially iterating on smaller runtimes that are less invasive and single threaded by default can help improve Rust async story. I mean, I like this idea. Maybe I just need to explore them all. I guess I've always just been a Tokyo Andy. Does that just make me a Tokyo Andy? Is that what that does? Am I just a Tokyo Andy? I just simply use Tokyo for all my async needs, and I really haven't tried much else. I, I think I downloaded Crossbeam once. Why is he calling them runtimes? Because they're runtimes. You can tell what it is. You can tell it's a runtime by the way it is. All right. Regardless of the runtime choice, we end up doing part of the kernel's job in user space. If you allow me to play on Green's pun 10th tenth, tenth rule, any sufficiently advanced async Rust program contains an ad hoc, informally specified, potentially bug-ridden implementation of half of an operating system scheduler. Modern operating systems come with highly optimized schedulers that are excellent at multitasking and support async I.O. through I.O. Uring and Splice. Uh, they should make... Uh, they should make uh, they should make better use of these capabilities. Let's finally address the elephant in the room: threads. With their familiarity present uh, present a path to make a synchronous code faster with minimal adjustment. For example, take our sync code to read a file from above and put it into a function. There we go. Ooh, look at that box dine error. Box dine error. This. Is the first way I ever handled errors was box dine error. It's also the way I hated my life. You know, like that's my first major program, the drum machine on Twitch with Rust. Box dine error everywhere. 
We can call this a function inside of the new scopes thread. Okay, there we go. We get a little thread. We get a little scope. We do one of these. Read some contents. We got another content. We got another content. Look at all that content. No join. Threads get joined automatically once the scope ends. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Well, that's nice. That code uh, looks, but are like, but I assume scope spawn are. What does this mean? Are these? What what is this? Like, are these their own threads? Are these operating system threads, or are these some so, some sort of green thread? I assume they're operating system level threads. You don't really necessarily want to do operating system level threads, right? They're OS threads. I assume they're OS threads. Yeah, they're OS threads whose lifetime is limited by the scope they're created in. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's really expensive still, right? Uh, that code looks almost identical to the single-threaded version. Notably, there are no await calls. Okay. Uh, yeah, fair. Fair. Uh, where read contents par uh, part of the public API could be used in both async and sync callers, eliminating the need for asynchronous runtimes. Async Rust might be more memory efficient than, the th uh, than threads at the cost of complexity and worse ergonomics. As an example, uh, if the function were async and you called it outside uh, of a runtime, it would compile but not run. Futures do nothing unless being pulled. Correct. This is a common foot gum for newcomers. I have... I have done this. You know what the worst part is? Is when you try to ignore an error because you look at this right here and it's an error, right? So you look at the function's content as an error. So you go underscore equals, read this. Like you just want to ignore the error. You don't care. But what you don't realize you did is you just underscore equal the future. And therefore it never runs. And you have no idea that that didn't happen. And it takes forever to figure out why things it's, it's a painfully slow process to figure that out. All right. In recent benchmarks, async Rust was 2x faster than threads, but the absolute difference was only 10 milliseconds per request. To put that into perspective, this uh, this about as long as PHP takes to start. In other words, the difference is negligible for most applications. I'd really like to challenge that one because I can't imagine that's true. Right, because I can't. Can, can you really just spawn off OS threads that easily, and it really only adds just a little bit of time? That is that true? A good PHP roast. Very. Hey, yeah, ten milliseconds is a huge amount because you got to remember when you have like a constellation of microservices, it grows. Yeah, I mean, we just read Java. Java said it was about two megabytes per thread. PHP has completely different uh, use case to Rust. This is correct. 10 milliseconds is massive. It is massive. All right, thread-based frameworks uh, like the now inactive Iron showcase the capability of effortlessly handling tens of thousands of requests per second. This is a further complemented by the fact modern Linux systems can manage tens of thousands of threads. Tens of thousands of threads per second is, 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 is kind of like is peas for Rust. I mean, Node, Bun on an empty request does like 80 or 90,000 or whatever on my local machine. I don't know what that equals. Rust doing it. Like, if I take Bun, create a server that just echoes back a post body for whatever you send it, right? Create an echo and just do that. I can get it, you know, pretty high up, you know, not 100,000, but pretty high. Go is like 180,000 uh, on my, this is all my machine, all local testing. So again, grain of salt. Uh, and then Rust is like 200 and some thousand. So, you know, when I see tens of thousands, I don't think, ooh, wow, right? Like, is there a big difference? Stop with your golden kappas. Uh, we already looked into it. Project Loom. All right. Turns out uh, computers are pretty good at doing multiple things at once. As an important caveat, threads are not available for fe uh, or feasible in all environments. I'm not knock – by the way, I'm not knocking this. I just – I don't have any data on whether this is worse or better. I'm just curious – if it is actually better or worse. As an important caveat, threads are not available or feasible in all environments, such as embedded systems. My context for this article is primarily conventional server-side applications that run on top of platforms like Linux. 
Yep, just Linux. Uh, I would like to add that threaded code in Rust undergoes the same stringent safety checks of, uh, as the rest of the Rust code. Okay, fair. It is protected from data races, null dereferences, and dangling references, ensuring a level of thread safety that prevents many common pitfalls found in concurrent programming. Since there is no garbage collector, there never will be any stop-the-world pause to reclaim memory. Traditional arguments against threads simply don't apply to Rust. Fearless concurrency is your friend. Fearless concurrency. Oh, we got a tweet. We got a tweet, people. Concur ANSI. Is it ANSI or ANSI? I always, I always forget this one. Is it ANSI or ANSI? ANSI. ANSI, not ANSI. ANSI. Fearless concurrency. And ship it to production. Ship it. Ship that one. ASCII? JS is a religion. <laughs> so is Rust. So is all programming languages. Hello, Primogen. What did I miss? Not a lot. We're about to go to the last one. All right, let's see. And if you need to share state between threads, consider to use a channel. I've never used much for channels. I do want to use more channel stuff. I feel like there's a lot of cool things you can do. I really think it's cool that you can break from a loop and return a value in Rust. So you could have like a Tokyo select in a loop, receiving values, waiting for something to happen from multiple different sources. And then when you get the thing you need, you can return it via a break out of the expression. I always thought that was pretty kind of clever, you know? I always thought that was pretty dang clever. And I, I just don't, I don't think about that enough. You know what I mean? Uh, my original intention was uh, to, adv uh, uh, to advise newcomers to sidestep Async or Rust 4, giving the ecosystem time to mature. However, since I realized that this is not feasible, given that a lot of libraries are Async first and new users will encounter Async Rust one way or another and cry in Async Rust, truly. Truly cry in Async Rust. Instead, I'd recommend to use Async Rust only when you really need it. Just learn how to write a good synchronous Rust first th and then, if necessary, transition to Async Rust. Learn to walk before you run. Fair, fair. If you have used uh, Async Rust, stick to Tokyo, a well-established libraries like Request and SqueelX. Uh, in your own code, try to avoid Async-only public APIs to make downstream usage easier. Oh, this, these are actually all really good pieces of advice. This is actually, a, this is great advice right here. However, it's valuable to know that there are alternatives to Tokyo and that they are worth exploring. Uh, one hard part, though, is that if you have a thread running and it blocks because it hits a sync API that you don't realize is sync for a long time, you can get some goofy results in Tokyo, right? Like some things can happen that you may not be expecting and it can be, uh, it can slow your program down a whole bunch. It can block things. Uh, it's not necessarily as straightforward as, as just simply go, you know? Uh, however, it's valuable to know that there are alternatives. Okay, yep. At its core, Rust and its standard library offers just the absolute essentials for async await. The bulk of the work is done in crates developed by the Rust community. We should make more use of the ability to iterate on async Rust and experiment with different designs before we settle on a final solution. In binary crates, think twice. If you really need to use async, uh, to use async, it's probably easier to just spawn a thread and get away with blocking I/O. In that case, you have a CPU, uh, CPU bound workload. You can use Rayon to paralyze your code. Rayon is pretty good. Uh, I've, I've I've played around with it. If you don't need async for performance reasons, threads can often be simpler alternative. Fair. It's fair. I, I really, just threads and channels. I think I just need to use just use those more. But I will say that the Go, Go supporting syntax for channels and how channels work is massively easier. The fact that you have to have a single read and multiple writes and you got to clone things around and all that, I feel just like it makes it harder. You know, uh, isolate async code. If async is truly indispensable, consider isolating your async code from the rest of your application. I never know how to do this. It leaks. It's very, very leaky. Keep your domain logic synchronous and only use async uh, for I.O. and external services. Following the guidelines will make your code more composable. Okay, 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 okay. And accessible. And on top of that, the error messages of sync rust are much easier to reason about. Facts. Facts upon facts. Facts that in a machine. Async rust feels like a different dialect, significantly more brittle than the rest of the language. I still don't know what pin is. Uh, the default mode of write for writing rust should be synchronous. 
freely after a strustrup inside rust. There are uh, there is a smaller, simpler language that is waiting to get out. Strustrup. Uh, Bjarn, is this Bjarn? Bjarn made a little uh, little little post. It is a language that most Rust code should be written in. I actually really like this. This was really great. It definitely makes me need to think more because I just reach for async Rust first. I I reach for async Rust first, and I don't necessarily consider its implications. You know what I mean? I just grab it. And I'm so, it's almost second nature. Exactly. Like when I start a project, I, I it, it was a very balanced article. This was a very, this was a tremendous one. Hey, Cora, a, a Corrode appreciated this. This was, this was, this was a beautiful article. Um, async Rust is really difficult and really bizarre. And I think I reach for it and I'm just so used to it. And I program a certain way to it that I think often I forget Maybe there's other ways, and maybe I should not reach right away for async rust. Maybe I need to just try spawning some threads and start using channels. I'm going to try that next time. Honestly, I'm going to try that next time. Next time I do anything, I'm just going to try to do uh, – uh, I'm going to try, try spawning and tossing out something different. I feel like I'm pretty good at rust. I'm okay at async rust, pretty good at rust. I don't know the deeper sides, right? I, I call myself a level one developer, meaning that – like, I wouldn't be able to effectively write Tokyo well, right? I don't know async Rust down to its core and how it's actually done. I just know how to use it. I'm level one deep. I know how to use everything. I don't know how it works at a deeper level. Whereas, like, something like TypeScript, I know at, like, a level two. I could write pretty much any library out there. I feel completely confident in it. I don't think I have a lot of, I don't think I have a lot of problems with it. Um, go, I'm like a 0.5 developer. I think I could be better. I just haven't done a lot. I just haven't done enough production level go. You know what I mean? I just haven't done that. Yeah, I feel like I can do lifetimes. I don't feel like I'd have a hard time writing like a really performance-based library with no copying in all lifetimes. I just don't because I just clone. You know what I mean? I just, I just clone because I don't care. I don't care for most of the times. Most of the times I'm just trying to get the thing correct and make sure I like what I see because Rust is one of these languages that it requires a different feel to really be good at. It's different than other languages. Like generally when I'm programming Go or JavaScript, I can kind of just, I can mostly just kind of do the thing. But Rust, you kind of got to take a slightly different approach to. It's just, I don't fully have the write everything first try with Rust yet. I think I just need to do it a little bit more, you know. I got to get there. It's a take a step back language, but I don't I don't believe in take a step back languages. I really think that that's just experience. I don't like the idea of taking a step back either. I really I think that it's you should just be able to free write ejaculate code at high speed and get somewhere. That means you've learned a language sufficiently. And I'm mostly there with Rust. I can mostly just rage program rust, but I'm not quite there. Huh? Whiteboard masturbation first. So I never do whiteboard masturbation. I'm not a big fan of whiteboard masturbation. I don't like to, I don't, I don't generally, I think it's, uh, I think it's, I think that the more you plan out a program besides for the high bits, I think often you don't get anything out of it. You've just wasted time. A zig. I'm definitely not good at zig. Zig. I'm like 0.1. Oh, camel. I'm like 0.1. You know, I just need an excuse to say masturbation. Okay, fair. Anyways, uh, let's go marker. Uh, I need to come up with a better name of uh, of this title. What should I call this this thing? Because the state of async Rust runtimes is actually really misleading to what this article's about. Dr. Watson ejaculates 11 times in the Sherlock Holmes stories. That's the strangest fact I've ever heard. The name is the Think Twice Agenda.